Good morning, everyone. I'm Jack Sullivan. I am a partner at the Labor and Employment Group of Dorsey and Whitney, and thank you for joining us today for the Aggressive National Labor Relations Board, What All Employers Must Know. Um, thank you in particular for those of you who have joined us in person. We have a few uh, in-person attendees, and um, I'm grateful for that as we begin the transition to in-person events after the long period that we've all spent on um, remote um, uh, uh, CLEs and remote uh, presentations. Um, I'll introduce myself briefly first. Um, so I bring, I think, a unique perspective to labor and employment issues. I spent 15 years as a journalist before I became a lawyer. Um, and journalism, as you may know, is a union dense sector of uh, union dense profession. And um, for the last three or four years of my time in journalism, I actually was the elected representative of a union for the newspaper where I worked. So in my practice, I try to bring an understanding of the issues that uh, attract employees to unions um, while I'm advising employers on what they need to do when they're dealing with organizational efforts and when they're relating with their unions. Um, our talk today is going to touch on what is a potentially unprecedented stance that the Labor Board is taking with regard to organizing efforts and with regard to um, employer union relationships. Before we begin though, there's a few housekeeping issues that I want to cover. Um, today's program is going to be 60 minutes long. Um, if you're here in person, please uh, sign the attendance form and return that after you're done. It's, there's a copy on the tables. Um, and for everyone, um, the presentation materials were included in the email that you received yesterday. So um, if you wanna refer to the materials that we'll be going through today in the future, you have a copy of that already. And finally, there'll be a CLE code that um, I give about halfway through. So be listening for that if you are joining us from a state where a code is required to confirm attendance. Today, we're gonna begin with a brief overview of where things stand um, with regard to the law that applies uh, to union efforts, um, the National Labor Relations Act. And we'll also discuss the political and administrative structure of the National Labor Relations Board, because that is the context really where these unprecedented uh, rules and unprecedented initiatives are arising from. Um, we'll touch briefly on the current environment for union efforts, um, the attraction that seems to be there in the public for um, union efforts. And then we'll go through the current uh, sought after changes in the law that the Labor Board is looking to enact and the aggressive new priorities that they have before turning to the risks that uh, are confronting all employers given the approach that the Labor Board is taking to these issues. So beginning with a brief overview of the National Labor Relations Act and National Labor Relations Board. So the National Labor Relations Act dates back to 1935. It was part of the New Deal package of legislation that um, aimed to protect organizing activity, union activity in workforces. Um, what it does is protects the forming and joining of unions and um, the decision not to, not to join a union. Um, it's important for all employers to remember that the law does not govern only acts by unions themselves. It protects concerted activities by employees for what the law calls mutual aid and protection. These are section seven rights. So what does that mean? That means if two employees gather together and approach a supervisor, approach a manager and raise a concern about their workplace, about their working conditions, that is potentially, if not most likely, concerted protected activity. It can also be one employee speaking up on their own initiative for other employees to raise a concern for um, what they view as the common good and presenting that to management. So the, the section seven rights are important to keep in mind as we move through today's presentation. 
The act also defines uh, what are called unfair labor practices. And so these are instances or allegations where an employer has taken an action that somehow interferes with those Section 7 rights or potentially takes a negative action towards an employee because the employee exercised those Section 7 rights. And just to understand the process of an unfair labor practice, what would happen is an employer takes an action and then someone, an employee or potentially a union, files a charge with the regional office of the National Labor Relations Board and alleges, we believe Section 7 rights have been violated. We believe an unfair labor practice has been committed by this employer. The regional office of the labor board then investigates the charge and comes to a finding, a preliminary finding of whether there's evidence to support the charge. So as you might um, see, there's, a, there's an analogy to the criminal justice system where there's a certain amount of prosecutorial discretion and what gets investigated and what the outcomes of those investigations are. And that is the framework in which the current administration of the labor board is um, pursuing the initiatives that they've identified. The board itself is made up of five members and it is defined to include three members from the political party of the president and two members from the opposition party. So it is certainly a political board, a political agency of the federal government. Um, in general, the board acts like a court of law. So when one of those unfair labor practice charge cases um, winds its way through the board system, the ultimate decision maker, if an employer or a union chooses to press this that far, would be the board itself. So it will make a decision on whether the act was violated, and then its decision carries um, administrative authority going forward. It would be a new rule of law for board proceedings going forward. Um, the current Democratic members, their professional backgrounds, I think, are important to keep in mind. Um, two of the three members are former, um, formerly served in top roles for the National SEIU Union. Um, and the chairwoman had been a uh, chief had been the chief labor counsel for the U.S. Senate committee that oversees labor issues, working for Democrats on that panel. That would be typical when there's a Republican president. The majority board is made up of people who have represented employers or who have worked on labor issues for sort of the Republican perspective. There's another important person to know about and that is the general counsel of the National Labor Relations Board. So the general counsel is the top administrative leader of the labor board. Um, she's appointed by the president and she leads both the Washington DC headquarters and all of the regions uh, across the country, those regional offices that investigate unfair labor practice charges and that prosecute cases when there's evidentiary support. Um, the current general counsel, um, Jennifer Abruzzo, has uh, more than 20 plus years working in the field for the National Labor Relations Board. Um, most recently, before she became general counsel, she was a lawyer for the Communication Workers of America, that national union, before she became the general counsel. Um, it is, as I've mentioned before, the, the general counsel sets priorities for all those regional offices. She gives direction as to the sorts of things that should be investigated and the sorts of things that, um, that should be prosecuted. And that's really where we'll spend some time today is um, talking about the issues that the general counsel has identified as places where she would like to change the law where um, there are issues that the that the administration has identified as um, even though they're not presently prohibited, they are things that the labor board would like to see be determined to be violations of the act going forward. <clears throat> 
Um, the region, um, excuse me, the board can do this in a couple different ways. Uh, one of the ways would be by bringing a case that alleges an act is a violation, um, an act of an employer is a violation of the National Labor Relations Act, and then press that prosecution all the way through to the labor board until there is a change in the law. Um, and also the general counsel can file briefs in other actions, a dispute that would be pending between a union and an employer right now in front of the board and uh, weigh in and say, these are issues that are at play in this dispute. And this is how we would like to see them resolved so we can see a new rule going forward. And I'll get to those um, examples of both as we go forward. There's a broader context that all this is happening in, and that is that um, people who pay attention to this area see union activity, union organization, and support for unions at um, really uh, notable highs, if not all time highs. Um, some have compared the current level of organization um, to the level of organization that occurred after the act was initially passed back in the 1930s. Um, the specific numbers that support that view include in the first half of the current federal fiscal year, there's been about a 60% increase in the number of petitions filed with the board for organizational elections. So this is when um, a union or a group of employees is seeking an election at their workplace for a union to be formed and recognized to represent them going forward. Um, that's a 60% jump in the first six months of this fiscal year compared to the first six months of the previous fiscal year. There's no real way to know for sure why that is happening. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, some of the things that some of the issues that people have pointed to are an awareness of workplace issues because of COVID issues about workplace safety and hours of operation and that sort of thing. It sort of raised potentially the attention of employees to the rules that are being set for their workplaces. Um, there's also um, some very notable and high profile organizational efforts underway that I'm sure people here and people on the webinar are aware of. So um, the Amazon organizing efforts, the Starbucks organizing efforts, things like that, where um, and now uh, Apple retail stores have begun to see organizational campaigns. So there are these things that are really attracting a lot of attention that then are potentially um, inspiring people in other workplaces to consider uh, bringing forward an organizational petition. There's also a sense, and um, we've seen this in some of the communications from employees to some of our clients, that people are seeing unions as an agent of social change. And by that, I mean, you know, five, six years ago, um, a union petition might uh, address or seek only to increase wages, improve benefits, deal with sort of bread and butter type of workplace issues. But now um, organizational petitions, if they're accompanied by a letter of, by, from the employees explaining their motivation, they might um, specifically call out you know, a, a desire for social justice, a desire for um, equity in the workplace, um, things that are certainly within the broad realm of what a union might advocate for, but are certainly not a traditional area where a union might be organizing around. Um, and finally, there's a, a demographic change that people have pointed to, and that is a higher number of uh, younger and college educated employees in retail and service jobs. So you have people in retail and service jobs who might have a greater awareness of Section 7 rights, of labor law, of the sorts of things that they can do, and then they are the people that then might be leading an organizational effort in their workplace. Those of you who have uh, longer experience in labor relations or in labor law will know that um, this idea that the law changes from one administration to the next, that in and of itself is not new. And 
Um, I'll talk a bit about this pendulum and how it's swung in the past, just so we have that broader context. Um, one area that people may think of is what's known as wine garden rights. So this is the right in a union environment for an employee to have a coworker be with them in an interview with an employer or a, or a supervisor that may lead to discipline. It has generally always been the case since the Weingarten decision was made years ago that that right exists in a union workplace. So if there is a union that's been recognized as the bargaining representative of employees at a company, that if an employee is asked to come into a meeting that may result in discipline, that that employee has the ability to say, you know, I would like my coworker Victoria to be with me because I wanna have a, a union representative with me. There was a brief period of time where a democratic board um, extended that right to all workplaces. So any person could have a coworker with them in this sort of a, investigative meeting. Um, it is an example of where a Democratic board in 2000, so under the in the last year of the Clinton administration, issued a decision that extended that right everywhere. Um, and four years later, the Republican board under the George W. Bush administration reversed that opinion and restored the law to where it had been in the past. Um, similarly, there's been a flip in um, the extent that union solicitations um, are assumed to be, to be uh, permitted on an employer's email system. So um, in 2014, uh, a Democratic board said that um, employees can use their employer's email system for organizational activity when they're doing that on non-work time. Um, and just a few years ago in 2019, the Republican board reversed that and said that employers have the right to restrict email use um, as long as that's being done in a non-discriminatory way. And so, so by that, what I mean is I, I think of it as what I have on the slide here of the Girl Scout cookie test, that if you generally allow people to solicit donations for causes or solicit sales for Girl Scout cookies without any repercussions, and then there's an email that goes out that is related to Section 7 activity, if you crack down on that, then potentially there's going to be a Section 7 problem because it looks like you're distinguishing between the content of the message when it is a union-related message versus a non-union-related message. If this pendulum swinging is an analogy, I, I think of it as, you know, it swings slowly generally, but now it's been stopped. There's been a jetpack attached to it and it's been fired back from the right to the left. And um, how this is happening is through a series of directives that the general counsel has made to regional offices about what are called mandatory submissions to advice. What that means is there's a division in the labor board's headquarters in Washington that is the advice division, the division of advice. And the directive is that when there are certain issues that come up in an investigation out in any of the regions across the country, the regional offices are directed to review that file and review those materials with the staff in Washington so that headquarters can decide, is this a case that is a vehicle through which we want to seek a change in the law? Um, a number of things that have been targeted in, um, in this directive for mandatory submissions of advice. Um, Weingarten rights, so as I noted before, that since 2004, it has been restored to the position that Weingarten rights only exist in a union workplace. Well, the general counsel has identified that as an area where if there's an issue that arises in a non-union workplace where um, there's an allegation that a person sought the um, representation of a coworker in an investigative meeting and that that was denied, 
if that results in a charge for the regional office, then the labor board will want to review that charge to determine if that's a case in which they want to bring all the um, bring forward to the board itself to seek a change and to bring back that law that existed only for four years, which is that Weingarten rights extended in um, non-union workplaces. Um, since 1985, it's been um, a, a common part of an anti-union campaign, of an employer's campaign, when there's organizing going around, uh, when there's an organizing campaign underway, um, for an employer to say, you know, if, if there's a union here, then I'm going to be limited in my ability to speak directly with you. And the, print, the basis of saying that is that is the fundamental reason why a union is recognized. It is the bargaining representative of employees. And so when there's a union present, an employer is restricted from what's called direct dealing, going to individual employees and making negotiations about individual working conditions when there's a union present. It's It's been a typical argument that an employer might make during an organizational campaign to say, you know what, if there's a union here, my ability to speak with you is going to be limited. Your access to me is going to be limited. If you have a problem, it's going to have to go through the union steward through a grievance and come up in that way. And I'm going to have limitations placed on me um, in terms of what I can deal with when you when you have an issue. Um, the Labor Board has identified that this TriCast decision from 1985 as something that they want to reverse. So they want to make it so that an employer is not able to say that during an organizational campaign and that if an employer does say something along that line, that that would be a violation of the act and would result in an unfair labor practice charge. Um, a couple other areas that have been targeted. Um, one is um, the access of non-employees, so union organizers generally, to employer property. Um, the board has identified as a target two decisions that were issued in 2019 that allowed employers to exclude union representatives from public spaces, such as parking lots and things like that. Um, and the that would be the general rule now, but again, it's been targeted for reversal by this labor board, um, by the administration of the, of the, of the board. Um, also, confidentiality and non-disparagement provisions and settlement agreements. So the board is taking the position that um, these provisions restrict an employee's ability or a former employee's ability to discuss their working conditions, to discuss their job and what it was like at their job. And so they are, the board is taking the position that um, those sorts of clauses violate the National Labor Relations Act. And again, these are things that are now lawful under current board law, but that if an employer took one of these actions and it resulted in a charge to a region that was then investigated, it is something that um, could potentially result in a unfair labor practice investigation and prosecution and potentially would be involved um, in a settlement that the region would seek with the employer. And so I'll, I'll turn to that next. Regional offices have a requirement that after, if they find that a charge has evidentiary support, they need to seek to settle it with the employer. And when they when they do that, they they generally say something like, you know, there have been ten allegations made against you, seven of them or some number of them have evidentiary support, and we want to settle them. So things that might end up on that list of a violation would be one of these acts that right now are considered lawful. So the board might say, or the region might say, this confidentiality provision in a settlement agreement violates the act, even though that is actually permitted under the act, they would take the position in the settlement document that it's something that needs to be addressed through the settlement. So in that instance, it might be voided uh, or the employer might be asked to void the agreement. 
Um, similarly, there might be an employer who is dealing with an organizational campaign who says that access to employer access to management message that, um, again, has been lawful since 1985. Um, the region might say, you said access to management might be limited. We're taking the position that that is a violation. So we're seeking a settlement related to that. Um, and the the motivation behind this is that um, regions have sort of always used the settlement process as one in which they they might seek uh, a redress of the alleged wrongful act, um, knowing that they, the region, have uh, a certain amount of leverage in that settlement negotiation. If the employer refuses to settle, then their choice is to go to a trial in front of the administrative law judge and incur potentially a substantial amount of costs for that future litigation. Um, a key area where there has been a, a, a very dramatic change in how the board is approaching settlements relates to situations in which there has been an allegation that an employee has been terminated in violation of the act. And so I'll talk about that now. Um, when this happens, it has always been the case that an employee would have a, um, a claim for back pay. So a person's terminated in June, um, the region investigates and comes to the conclusion that there's evidence to support the fact that that termination may have been because the person was engaged in Section 7 activity. And if that finding comes out in September, then there might be three months of back pay. That person might have a claim for the amount of money they didn't earn in the time that they were out of a job. Now, the board is extending that concept of back pay for what they're calling full remedies. And what they mean is they're trying to tie financial impacts that result from the person not having a job into the settlement. So that can include things like late fees on credit cards. If the person says, I lost my job, I missed a payment, I made a payment late, well, then the, the region would say, you need to reimburse that person for that late fee on their credit card. Um, they, the, the guidance identifies specifically you know, fees and other sorts of costs um, that would get reimbursed if the person has to withdraw from retirement savings. Um, they even specify, and to this day, I have no idea how this would be quantified, but compensation for damages caused to an employee's credit rating. So again, no idea how you would quantify that, but that is something that in the guidance document, the region, the, excuse me, the, the administration headquarters has identified as the sort of thing that a region office, regional office should seek compensation for. Um, also, loss of a home or a car because of an inability to keep up with loan payments, that there would be some sort of compensation that's tied to that, even though it's difficult to see how you would quantify the financial impact of that. Um, if that is the sort of thing that would happen, a regional office would ask in the settlement, ask the employer to agree to repay that person, to make that person whole for whatever that impact was. Um, in addition for this, the, these full remedies, um, there are a number of things that are non-monetary, but that um, I think when they're put in practice are things that potentially tip the employer union balance in a workforce. And so what I mean by that are, are these things. So um, training of managers. So um, this isn't necessarily inherently wrong, but as part of a settlement agreement, a region might require an employer to set mandatory meetings where supervisors are trained by a regional office representative on the National Labor Relations Act and employees' rights under the Act. Um, there are there's a requirement for progress reports about if there's training that's involved, then an, an employer has to submit a report to the regional office as part of the settlement agreement, saying that they've conducted that training. Um, and there's it has been typical, as, as many people likely know, that um, one result of an adverse finding at, as the result of an unfair labor practice investigation is 
for there to be a notice placed in the um, in the workplace that says, you know, we will not violate the act, we will not take these actions, that that has always been part of the settlement. Now the regions are requiring notice readings. So requiring an agent of the employer, potentially with a, a representative of the union present, potentially with a representative of the board present to read that notice out loud to all employees. So you might schedule multiple meetings to cover your entire workforce. Um, and one thing that I have one client that was in this position and equated it to um, having to write, I will not violate the National Labor Relations Act 100 times on the blackboard, that they had to send a letter of apology to the employee that, or employees who were affected by what the board has found to be um, a, an unfair labor practice allegation supported by evidence. Um, you know, a letter of apology in and of itself may not seem to be the sort of thing that carries a high cost, but, you know, if you think about that and the employee has received that, what can they now say about that publicly? What can they now um, do with that letter once they've received it. It's, it's something that in my experience has never been sought before, but I've seen it now in um, at least two different regions that have required that as part of the settlement agreement. So um, I'd mentioned before that another area where the, um, the labor board's administration can seek changes in the law is by filing briefs in cases that were otherwise pending in front of the labor board. Um, the administration has done that recently in a case called Semex Construction Materials Pacific. Um, so this is a, you know, a dispute between the employer and a union in an organizational campaign that was prosecuted by a region the board has weighed in, the administration has weighed in seeking some very dramatic changes to labor law. So one of them, and perhaps the most important one is that in that brief, the administration is asking the labor board to declare that captive audience meetings are inherently coercive and should be prohibited. So what does that mean? Um, a captive audience meeting has been really a central part of an employer's campaign in an organizational elected election since 1948. And from an employer's perspective, this is the logic that, you know, a union organizing campaign goes on without the employer's knowledge for a large part. It's sort of, it's sort of an iceberg. There's lots of conversations happening off site. There's people who are being approached and they're signing union authorization cards or petitions and that sort of thing. And it's only when the iceberg breaks the surface and the petition and the cards are presented to the employer that the employer knows that there's this issue there and that there's going to be a campaign and the employer wants to get their message out. So the law has protected employers ability to express their opinion and to ask their employees to vote no in a campaign like that. Um, employers have since 1948 been able to set a mandatory meeting to have people have their employees come in and hear that message from the employer. Um, what the board is doing now, what the administration of the board is doing, is asking the, the decision-making body, the five-person board, to enact a rule that says, you know what, these mandatory meetings are inherently coercive. They're coercing people to listen to the employer message under the, the pain of some sort of discipline if they don't attend the mandatory meeting and that part of the right to hear a message includes the right to not listen to the message. And so the, a mandatory meeting that an employer would hold um, if that ends up in an unfair labor practice charge is something that might result in a settlement and might result in an adverse finding for the employer if that rule is adopted. Um, Similarly, there's an ex what could potentially be a dramatic change in the in the balance of, of what happens after a petition is filed if the general counsel um, achieves what it's asking for in the Semex case. And that is 
that um, to go back to a rule um, called the Joy Silk Rule that had existed from 1949 to 1971, in which if an employer is presented with um, authorization cards for 80% of the employees in a workforce, that um, the union sort of, it's, it's a card check rule that once that's once those are there, if the employer doesn't have, can't show a good faith doubt in the majority status, then they have, um, then they're, then they're required to recognize the union. And since 1971, it's been the case that an employer can simply insist on a union election if they, if without having to explain their reasons for it. So you can just simply decline to recognize the union, regardless of how many chart um, cards have been presented in front of you and, um, and go forward to the election and with the campaign. So this would really dramatically alter the balance of and the assessment of risk of what an employer should do when they're confronted with um, an organizational uh, request, uh, a request for recognition and um, authorization cards or petitions. Um, just the other day, so on Tuesday, um, the board, um, the administration of the board took, um, uh, again, a, a step that is being viewed as, um, if not unprecedented, extraordinarily rare. And that is in um, the these the Starbucks organizational campaigns that I think people are generally aware of. Um, the board is seeking a nationwide injunction against Starbucks to prevent it from um, taking certain actions when responding to organizational campaigns. And what is unique about this is that the administration is looking to go beyond just the stores where there have been organizational efforts and seeking certain remedies that would apply to every location across the country. So um, there would need to be a notice reading in a Starbucks where there has never been a union a union campaign or any union interest. There would need to be things posted in those stores that describe uh, what the rights are of employees to form a union and um, things that the employer cannot do. Um, and really, you know, what is probably also one of the motivations of the of the administration is if that ends up in with the force of a court order, then um, there's going to be a strong discouragement to many actions that would might otherwise occur because you're not just violating a board rule, you're violating a court order, which would carry potentially different penalties. So um, it's really a way that is um, an act that is potentially aiming to change the balance and how that particular employer is going to be responding to future organizing efforts at future locations. And the difference is up until now, and the general approach would be that you know, it's decisions like this are made facility by facility. If there's 20 people who work at one business, then those 20 people decide if they want to uh, belong to a union or not. And if there's 30 people who work at an or at a facility in an entirely different state, then they decide whether they want to be represented by a union. So this order is really aiming to kind of break down those walls and and um, give. Uh, for that company, um, certain protections to employees and places where there haven't been any um, any activity or any need necessarily to restrict the employer from taking the actions that they might otherwise take. So you might wonder after everything that I've said, so what is the risk to me? Like what is the risk to our workplace for all of these changes? And um, I want to share an example of something that happened that um, is sort of, you know, taken from two true events, as it were. Um, there's an employer in a conservative state where um, they had a employee that they considered to be a problematic employee who had filed a number of complaints against coworkers and against supervisors. The human resources department investigated those complaints, went through them pretty thoroughly and came to the conclusion that they were not substantiated. Um, they informed the employee that, of that, and the employee continued to effectively file the same complaint over and over again. So the, 
HR responded and said, you know, like we've looked into this, there doesn't seem to be anything new here. This behavior continued. Um, there was sort of a warning, you know, please stop raising these allegations. That warning was disregarded. Um, the employee then was suspended for a day or two and said, you know, please just, when you come back, just don't do this anymore. The person came back, continued to engage in the same behavior and was terminated as a result of violating the direction to stop effectively from the employer's perspective, abusing this complaint process by filing the same allegation over and over again. Um, the employee brought charges to practically every state or federal agency that would apply, um, claiming retaliation, you know, effectively whistleblower retaliation. Um, every state agency that looked into it rejected the allegations and found they were not supported, except for the regional office of the National Labor Relations Board that, got, that applied to the state. They determined that the allegation that the person was terminated for engaging in concerted protected activity was substantiated, and they ordered the person to be reinstated to their position. They also ordered the person to be paid back pay as an example of these consequential damages that go beyond just the financial back pay, they ordered the employer to reimburse the person for tuition um, because she, the employee had claimed that she had, um, was, had paid for a class that she wasn't able to take because she needed to look for a new job. And so she effectively lost this tuition payment. So there was a need to pay that back. There was a requirement to send the employee a letter of apology, um, to post a notice in the workplace, and to read that notice over a series of full staff meetings um, in the workplace. Um, and uh, the the outcome of it was that there was um, you know the the employee did not return. So whenever there's an order for reinstatement, an employer can negotiate um, you know a payment of front pay in lieu of reinstatement, so additional money to not bring this person back. Um, many employers find that to be money well spent because of the potential disruption of having someone who's been ordered to be restored to their position being back in the workforce, particularly if there were grounds to terminate them in the first instance. There might be a desire to um, avoid that reinstatement, but you have to pay, provide some sort of compensation, some sort of financial benefit to the person to give up that right. So, um, you know, that was, I think, a good example of a practical effect of how these new rules are being applied to a real employer um, and a real situation and what the outcomes were for that employer. Um, similarly, I'm, a, I'm aware of a situation where um, you had where an employer had uh, made um, a, a, a relatively small number of layoffs coincidental to um, a union organizing effort that was underway. By that, I mean there was the organizational effort was sort of bubbling. The employer was coming to the financial decision that it needed to reduce its workforce, identified people um, for termination. Um, through non-discriminatory methods. They did not take into account whether the person was a union supporter or not when they were selected for termination. They went through with those layoffs and in the separation agreements, they included a standard confidentiality and non-disparagement clause. Um, the union organizing activity resulted in a petition. As part of that investigation, the regional office looked at these separation agreements and pulled out these confidentiality clauses and said, these are violations of the act. And, um, you know, you are required as part of the settlement, um, you know, inform these employees that they are, uh, that these provisions are voided. So the confidentiality agreement, the non-disparagement agreement are voided. So let's uh, talk a bit about what to do, um, given where things stand. And um, I think the most important idea to keep in mind is 
if you've thought that the National Labor Relations Act applies only to workplaces where there are um, where there's a union or where there is certainly an organizational campaign underway. Um, that is not the case. That has never been the case, but it is certainly the case where the regions are um, willing to look into any allegation that comes before them, regardless of the organizational or the union context. So that employer in the conservative state that I mentioned, no union, no union organizing activity, really just an employee who made the same complaint to multiple agencies and came up from her perspective with a very good result from the labor re board region compared to the other places. So um, whenever there is an action that falls within this category of a concerted activity for mutual aid and protection. So an employee who is complaining about conditions in the workplace, who's complaining about um, wages, uh, term, uh, other sorts of terms and conditions, just know that there are that you need to be very careful when considering an action against that employee if it is if the action is being considered at the same time that their complaints are happening. Um, it doesn't mean you can't terminate an employee if they're making complaints. Uh, you just have to be clear about your reasons for doing it and the documentation for your reasons for doing it in the event that that person might make an allegation that they were being terminated because of their uh, complaints. The allegation being that they're being terminated because they were engaging in concerted protected activity. Um, with regard to settlement agreements, so you know, if if there are standard confidentiality provisions that um, that you use, um, I think there's a way to assess the person and and the situation and and ask yourself, is this something that is you know, are these is there a union at here? Is there is there an, a sense that the people involved are aware of? this change and that they may bring the settlement agreement to a regional office of the board. And then if so, you may want to narrow the confidentiality agreement. So instead of sort of a broad requirement for confidentiality, it only requires confidentiality related to the uh, financial terms of the settle of the separation, which is something that the board has kind of carved out as a very small limitation to their otherwise uh, broad attempt to um, uh, declare these confidentiality provisions impermissible. Um, in terms of non-disparagement, that is, um, you know, a, a broad term, and um, again, the, the the regions are directed to look at those with a high level of scrutiny. And so a broad non-disparagement provision may want to be narrowed. You may want to narrow that to prohibit false statements about the employer and, and focus more clearly on the legal definition of defamation as opposed to just disparagement. The theory that the board brings to this, that the administration of the board is bringing to this is that the you know, disparagement potentially encompasses complaints and statements about your workplace that aren't false and that would otherwise therefore be section seven protected activity. If you end up in a situation where there has been an investigation and a board is, and, a, and a regional office is pursuing a settlement, um, you know, think about the big picture that you're facing. And by that, I mean, um, settlement requirements are, are not the law. Often the, the regions are asking an employer to agree to uh, penalties or to payments that they might not actually be ordered to do if the case were actually tried. So there's a different sort of settlement and financial analysis that has to be brought to bear. Is it actually worth the cost of litigation um, to knowing that even in an adverse uh, result, if you lose the case, you might not be ordered to do the thing that the region is asking you to agree to do in the first place. Um, so that is sort of a fact of what's happening here. The, the, the regional uh, offices are directed by the administration to seek these bigger penalties after trials but that's not up to them. 
the settlement agreements are up to them. The decision of what penalties to direct to be imposed are the decision of a independent administrative law judge. And so that judge may or may not agree to accept the region's recommendation that they go beyond a traditional penalty and impose some of these uh, much different and much broader penalties. Um, it's becoming uh, the sense that um, the litigation pressure that is typically asserted against an employer may be shifting. And so the, the regional offices, I, there have been news stories on this, I believe that you know the, these high caseloads are re requiring a lot of work on the part of regional lawyers, regional field investigators, and the people who work in all the regional offices. You know, there's more and more petitions being filed. That's more and more cases for them to handle. And it, it at times, is shifting the litigation pressure. I, I have a situation where um, in settlement negotiations, um, we presented a settlement proposal to a region that was flatly rejected three months ago. And within the last week, the region has said, you know, that sounds good to us. We just want to clear these cases. And there's a number of cases now that are being wrapped up um, so the region can focus its priorities on, um, on, uh, on, the, on, on other cases, on these petitions. And, you know, like with any organization made up of people, they have to prioritize. And the, the busyness of the offices is something that um, may be a factor that works to an employer's benefit. Um, it's hard to assume that that's the case. You know, regions aren't going to throw in the towel on a case that they believe have merit, but I think it underscores the benefit of, um, you know, having a relationship with the region, having counsel representing you that has a relationship with regional officers so they can talk about that and sort of get a sense of that and then um, kind of make that part of the negotiations for the settlement of a, of a charge. Um, the place where a lot of these rules are really affecting employers the most are in organizational campaigns when there has been a petition for a union election. And, you know, most employers don't have a lot of experience with this, with what to deal with, uh, how to respond to an organizational campaign. The rules, even in a you know, a good period, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago are, are complicated. You know, employers can't make threats or promises. Well, what's a threat or a promise? You know, if you say, I will always listen to your concerns as I always have, is that a promise in some way that could be construed by um, in an unfair labor practice charge or through an investigation of a charge to be a promise that, you know, I'll hear you out if you vote down the union. Um, so the the so it's never really clear as to the sorts of specific statements that are allowed or not allowed. I mean, there's things that would be clearly impermissible, but there's a lot of gray in that. Um, and right now you have, um, you know, these directives that are really increasing the scrutiny of any statement that an employer is going to make. So it's important if there is an organizational campaign to be certain that you're, um, you know, tapping those people on your team who have experience with how to handle these things. Um, you know, if you have labor relations employees who have dealt with organizational campaigns before and know the rules, um, obviously, legal counsel, there are non-lawyer consultants that offer their services to employers, but it's just important to know that this is always a tricky area. It will continue to be a tricky area. It's just that the potential penalties of a violation might be increased. Um, and one of the ways that uh, the board responds to what they consider to be an unfair labor practice violation in the course of an election um, they, you know, the, the board's perspective under the law is they want to preserve what they call laboratory conditions. They want employee, want this to be sort of a true test of employee sentiment of whether there's, um, whether they want a union representing them or not. And, um, the standard is potentially being pushed far down for, you know what, that was not the case. The employer activity, 
um, violated the act. There was a captive audience meeting and that poisoned minds in a way that makes this not a fair election. So we're gonna make you go through the whole thing again. We're gonna order a rerun election, which runs through the whole process again, but with the knowledge in the workforce that the employer must've done something wrong that got us to this point. So potentially that tips the scales against the employer. Um, you know, lurking out there is always the risk of what's called a bargaining order. So that would be a situation in which um, the regional office effectively says, you know, this election was sort of so poisoned that we're going to direct the employer to recognize and bargain with this union as if the union had won the election. Um, that is, it's a rare remedy, but it is one that the administration is seeking in some of these high profile cases. And finally, this um, Joy Silk priority that, that I'd mentioned before um, really changes the analysis of, of how to respond. You know, if, if, you, if you are aware that an organizing campaign is underway, what should you do and, and how should you respond? And a, a typical directive is to tell frontline managers, managers of facilities, you know, if someone comes to you and says, do you voluntarily recognize this union, that your answer should be a polite no thank you, and also to not accept anything that is attempted to be handed to you. Um, this joy silk issue is lurking behind that because if you do, if a person were to even inadvertently accept a stack of authorization cards, you know, um, a, a petition that has a lot of names on it, even though you don't know what those people were told to sign their name on that document, um, that might be the basis for an allegation that, you know what, you do not have a good faith basis to doubt the majority support for a union here. So we're going to bring to bear the Joy Silk issue and, you know, then find that you violated the act by not recognizing this even absent an election. Um, so it's, it's a tricky and potentially risky area right now. Um, and it's important, I think, to pay attention to what's going on, what changes in the law there are. Um, and to, you know, when you are confronted with labor issues, um, whether that's in a how to respond to an employee who's making complaints and potentially engaging in concerted activity, whether that's dealing with your union, if you are an employer who has union representation in some or all of your workforce, um, or if you're dealing with an organizational petition, um, you know, it's just always important to be aware of what the risks are, but Today, it's important to know that the risks are different, that the analysis is different. And so if you are confronted with one of these issues, um, you know, seek sound advice from those members of your team or those members in your support professionals that you turn to for advice to be sure that you can help choose the, uh, a, the best path forward what is going to be a tricky situation. With that, I thank you all for your time. Um, I'm grateful for those of you who came in person and for the many people who joined on um, online. Um, and I hope everyone has a good rest of the day. Thank you very much.